PR Military Analytics The war between Ukraine and Russia began in the steppes of Eastern Europe, but over time, the effects of the war spread to much wider areas. Against Russia's occupation policies, almost all European countries gathered under one roof for the same purpose. Especially in recent days, the north of Europe has started to pioneer this common goal with Finland's participation in NATO. The Scandinavian peninsula began to react much more harshly and jointly against Russia. This striking solidarity in the Triangle of Sweden, Finland and Norway created a bombshell effect with Norway's last critical step. Relations with Russia in the north were already tense. Now, with this decision taken by Norway, the relationship between Russia and northern European countries is getting worse. Let's explore this brave step of Norway together and see how Russia was shaken by this strong wind coming from Scandinavia and how this strong wind swept Vladimir Putin's men away. Beyond Ukraine, Washington and its European allies are ratcheting up pressure on Russia, including in the Arctic and Baltic Sea regions. In the past few years of East-West crisis, the U.S. military has vastly expanded its presence inside Norway, whose western border runs 1,400 miles along the North Atlantic Ocean and merges above the Arctic Circle with Russia. The Pentagon has created high-paying jobs and contracts amid some local controversy by investing hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade and expand American Navy and Air Force facilities in Norway. The new works included, most importantly, an advanced synthetic aperture radar far up north that was capable of penetrating deep into Russia and came online just as the American intelligence community lost access to a series of long-range listening sites inside China. Norway's air station north of the Arctic Circle is to become a regional hub for surveillance of Russia. Details on the joint project between the United States, Britain and Norway were provided earlier this month in comments by Norwegian Minister of Defense, Bjorn Ariel D. Graham, who said that the base will host USB-8, a Poseidon surveillance aircraft. Two Arctic base zones and the Ramsund Naval Base are the subject of an upgraded bilateral defense cooperation agreement between Washington and Oslo. They are classified as agreed areas which grant U.S. forces unimpeded access to the bases and exclusive rights to certain parts of them. The agreement provides for U.S. jurisdiction over all U.S. Army personnel in the country, including for crimes they commit off-duty and even over Norwegian citizens who come into contact with the agreed areas. Washington initiated talks on the bilateral agreement and the Biden administration said the deal was an invariable requirement for further U.S. investment in Norwegian facilities. The opportunity to store equipment and material in advance, which is included in the Norwegian-American agreement, clearly expresses the American commitment on agreed areas in Norway. Defense Minister Graham said at Venice the aim is to develop cooperation between Norwegian, British and American P-8 maritime surveillance aircraft in accordance with the investments that are made in the Norwegian Armed Forces long-term plan. These include five P-8 Poseidon surveillance aircraft bought by Norway, which will work with British Poseidons to search for and destroy underwater targets, that is submarines. Evans also hosts Norway's U.S.-produced F-35 fighter jets. Ramsund will serve as a maritime logistics hub for large-scale military activities in the region by the U.S. and other NATO powers. Graham said, In the current long-term plan for the defense sector, it's planned that the Ramsund naval base will have an expanded role as the Navy's base in the north, and that the base is further developed to support the Navy and allies, including expanded key facilities, storage, ammunition, logistics, and maintenance. Our NATO allies train and exercise regularly in Norway, something that may also involve periodic presence in connection with logistics support. Increased cooperation with the U.S. and other allies at Evans and Ramsund is desired and will provide economies of scale and increased operative effect. Meanwhile, in the shadow of Washington-Oslo cooperation against Russia's aggression, the tension between Norway and Russia is escalating with the measures taken by the Norwegian administration against the Russian embassy. Norway has declared 15 people persona non grata working at the Russian embassy in Oslo. Russian diplomats are defined as members of intelligence services that engage in activities incompatible with their diplomatic status. These diplomats are required to leave the country. The Norwegian government website reported. Norwegian Foreign Minister Anakin Wheatfield described the deportation as an important step in countering and reducing the level of Russian intelligence activity. Norway aims to protect its national interests by deporting 15 Russian diplomats it accuses of espionage. 
In Norway's message, Moscow is cited as the main source of espionage threat for Oslo. It was also noted that the country would welcome diplomats from Russia, but Russian intelligence services would not be allowed to work under diplomatic guise. Foreign Minister Anakin Hootfilt announced that they will not issue visas to intelligence officers who apply for visas to Norway. Anakin Widfilt did not elaborate on whether the government's decision was based on a particular event. Wiedefeld stated that the country's internal intelligence service will make the necessary statement on the subject. The Norwegian newspaper VG wrote that the number of expelled Russian diplomats was so high for the first time. The newspaper stated that about 40 people work at the Russian embassy in Oslo and the Kirkens and Barentsburg consulates, including the deported diplomats. The retaliatory response to Norway's decision to expel the Russian diplomats came without delay. The Russian embassy in Norway described this critical decision as an extremely hostile step and announced that it would retaliate against it. Fifteen Norwegian diplomats are expected to be expelled, according to Russia's threat of retaliation. Minister Widfeldt reacted to the statements of retaliation. Widfeldt said Russia has no reason to respond. We have Norwegian diplomats in Russia, but none of them are intelligence officers. Stating that his country wants to establish normal diplomatic relations with Russia, Widfeldt stated that they do not want people who claim to be diplomats and are actually intelligence officers. In addition, Norway expelled three Russian diplomats last year for allegedly being intelligence officers. On the other hand, blows are coming from Norway to Russia, one after another. Norway, which expelled 15 Russian diplomats, also decided to impose new sanctions on Russia. Norway has launched a new set of sanctions against President Putin and the Russian regime. These sanctions reflected the EU's 10th package of sanctions adopted by the EU on February 25, 2023. The sanctions are becoming more and more extensive and represent a strong and clear European response to Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine. Norway's powerful energy sector has been a major beneficiary, together with the United States of sanctions on Russia and the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines. Norwegian natural gas exports to Europe rose 3.3% in 2022 deliveries to Germany shot up to 11% year over year. Norway has complied with the EU sanctions against Russia with several adaptations. Sanctions are implemented in Regulation 1076 of the 15th of August 2040 non-restrictive measures regarding actions that undermine or threaten Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, independence and stability. These sanctions imposed by Norway, including an import ban and a price cap on crude oil and petroleum products, are hitting the Russian economy hard. In February, Russia's oil sector tax revenues fell by 46% compared to the pre-war period. On the other hand, with the departure of Russia, Norway became the energy champion of Europe. Norway is now the continent's largest supplier of natural gas, and last year, the country's energy earnings increased by $100 billion. The new front line for Europe's energy security is a modest office building overlooking a fjord in Stavanger, Norway. Inside, a company called Petoro manages three dozen of Europe's largest oil and gas fields on Norway's oil-rich continental shelf. These operations in Norwegian waters marked by massive offshore platforms and wells twisting thousands of feet below the ground have helped Europe heat its homes and generate electricity. Since the start of Russia's war in Ukraine, while Russia restricted its natural gas exports last year, Norway accelerated this export and is now the main fuel supplier to Europe. Norway also supplies more oil to its neighbors, replacing embargoed Russian oil. In short, the war in Ukraine helped add nearly $100 billion to Norway's oil and gas earnings. In other words, Oslo both supported Kiev in this war and strengthened its economy much more by taking advantage of Moscow's mistakes. On the other hand, Norway, a small country bordering Russia, is not a member of the European Union, but listens closely to its neighbors. After the war broke out, Brussels and European countries, mainly Germany, heavily dependent on Russian gas, leaned on Oslo for help. Norway already produces high volumes of gas and transports it to northern Europe via subsea pipelines. But the Oslo government has allowed additional production. Energy companies made adjustments that increased gas production at the expense of oil. The result was an 8% increase in Norway's gas production last year making Norway the source of about a third of the gas consumed in Europe. Norway has collected nice financial rewards for coming to Europe's aid. Pedoro, 20, 
made nearly $50 billion, nearly three times its 2021 earnings, as energy companies like Shell and BP posted record profits last year. According to the estimates of the Oslo government, revenues from oil and gas contributed $125 billion to the Norwegian state in 2022. It seems that the Ukrainian war helped boost the Norwegian economy while undermining the Russian economy. Norway, on the other hand, seems to have sworn to corner Russia in addition to the political and economic tensions. Norway is following the Russians on the coasts. Norway watches cautiously with Russian submarines and planes accelerating Arctic patrols. NATO ally Norway has announced that it has increased the number of maritime patrols near vital undersea gas pipelines off its coast. In addition, Norway released a video clip of the growing Russian threat in the Arctic. Videos provided by the Royal Norwegian Air Force provided critical dot near a maze of undersea pipelines carrying large quantities of natural gas to Europe and telecommunications cables connecting European countries. There is a high-stakes cat and mouse game between the two armies and the Russian attack submarines patrolling the area. The chief of the Royal Norwegian Navy noted that military activity around Norway has increased in the high north in the North Atlantic. The president stated that Russian submarines work differently than they did 10 years ago. The increase in military activity came as tensions escalated between NATO and Russia following the invasion of Ukraine. After a drastic decline in Russian natural gas flows to Europe, Norway has replaced Russia as the continent's largest supplier since an unexplained attack on the Nord Stream gas pipeline linking Russia and Germany last year. Norway, backed by NATO allies, has increased the security of its vast network of offshore pipelines and communication cables. Norwegian Foreign Minister Anakin Hootfilt said in an interview in Oslo that after explosions, we actually increased our presence on these facilities. The submarine, naval and air capabilities of the Russian Northern Fleet are largely unaffected by the war in Ukraine. Analysts say that Russia has invested heavily in its submarine fleet, making its boats quieter and more deadly. The new Belgorod submarine is designed to carry huge 25-meter-long nuclear torpedoes, as well as smaller mini-submarines capable of rescue or research. In summary, we'll wait and see if the escalation of tensions between Russia and Norway will affect Russia's war performance. The Ukrainian war took its place in the pages of history, not only as a land war, but also as a very comprehensive war, as an air and naval war. With the entry of the winter season, the intensity of the land attacks of both countries decreased. This was because the ground was muddy and it was difficult for war vehicles such as tanks and armored vehicles to advance on the ground. Instead, both countries rallied on missile and UAV stockpiles. Russia, in particular, carried out missile attacks through its navy forces. The Russian Black Sea Fleet and the Russian Navy forces in the Azov Sea launched missile attacks on Ukraine's infrastructure facilities and civilian settlements. But Russia's naval strength began to gradually decrease from February 2022 when the war began. It's a well-known fact that Russian President Vladimir Putin attaches great importance to naval power. He has told you that he has recently taken initiatives to increase his presence and power, especially in the Baltic and Arctic seas. This is because Putin had a Soviet education and Russia inherited Soviet naval power. However, the Russian Navy has difficulties in showing its effectiveness in the Black Sea. In recent days, the number of ships in the Russian Black Sea fleet has decreased. Let's now look at the details of the withdrawal of the Russian Navy from the Crimea and the Sea of Azov. Ukraine has been hit hard, especially because of Russia's attack on the Black Sea fleet. Infrastructure facilities were destroyed and civilian settlements suffered massive destruction. In order to cover this destruction and damage, the Ukrainian army embarked on a number of operations in order to end the presence of the Russian Navy in the Black Sea. Within these operations, 16 Russian ships, including the Russian flagship Miskva, were destroyed by the Ukrainian forces. Apart from these eight attack boats on the Dnipro River were also destroyed by the Russian forces. As of last weekend, six Russian warships remained in the Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. No missile carriers were detected among them. In particular, five Russian warships in the Black Sea and one in the Azov Sea are ready for battle. Russia had 17 warships, including the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. The exact whereabouts of the other 11 ships is unclear. Some Ukrainian officials assume that these 11 ships are headed for the Georgian coast. Another claim is that they were taken into care in Russian ports in the interior of the Azov Sea. 
The exact fate of these ships is unknown, but it is known that they did not land in the Mediterranean. Russia's naval group has reduced its presence in the Mediterranean to seven warships, including a total of 20 caliber type cruise missiles and three missile carriers. Since contemporary great powers are capable of quickly turning crisis into conflict, U.S. foreign policy demands that U.S. military forces be prepared to take advantage in warfare. These forces are likely to increase interoperability with partner countries, as foreign partners in Europe or Asia will have geographic reach and have special military capabilities that complement that of the United States. Russia's war with Ukraine, which began in February 2022, presented a rare opportunity for the United States to assist Ukraine in its defense against attack in the maritime field. The U.S. Navy helped implement modern naval denial in the Black Sea, with the European U.S. Navy working with Ukrainian coastal defense forces. The U.S. has also leveraged maritime alliances to improve access. From a strategic perspective, it has helped seasoned planners understand what a war between Russia and U.S. NATO forces might look like and has opened up new opportunities to build future advantages against Russia by reinforcing its wartime advantages, increasing interoperability with partners, and strengthening alliances. The U.S. Navy can increase its readiness for great power conflict. So what advantages gained here? As Western forces withdrew from the Black Sea after the Ukrainian war, the Russian Navy quickly established local naval control of the northern part of the seas around Crimea. In the first 48 hours of the conflict, the Russian fleet launched about 100 caliber long-range cruise missiles from both the Black and Caspian Seas to take down civilian and military targets in Ukraine. Moscow later expanded its kinetic employment to include coastal defense and air-launched cruise missiles. From Kiev's perspective, Gaining an advantage over the Russian Navy was beyond the capabilities of the much smaller Ukrainian Navy. But things began to change gradually, with the Russian Black Sea Fleet conducting tactical combat operations against Ukraine in close proximity to its NATO partners. The United States had to develop its combat fighting capabilities to support competition. Beginning in March 2022, U.S. policy changes allowed the U.S. Department of Defense to provide weapons systems and intelligence for operational employment. Specifically, the U.S. Navy sent Ukraine Harpoon Coastal Defense missiles, enabling Ukrainian Navy forces to develop maritime area awareness through information sharing mechanisms. In parallel, the U.K. provided Ukraine with a variety of weapons systems compatible with operational intelligence using new capabilities in the Sea of Azov. Ukrainian forces struck and damaged the Russian Alligator LSD in March, sinking the Russian Slava-class cruiser Miskva in the northwest of the Black Sea, forcing the Russians to withdraw from their naval outpost on Snake Island near Odessa. As Ukraine's achievements increased, Russia's sea distances in the Black Sea increased over time. Ukraine's operational employment resulted in the interruption of maritime traffic along its coastline, and the Russian Navy complicated its planning efforts against future targets in the northwestern Black Sea. As a result of their increasing coldness, operational capability, development and integration into the naval environment helped the Ukrainian Navy's defense of Odessa by reducing the Russian offensive action. Ukraine's refusal of Russia's control of the Black Sea prompted the World Food Program in July to resume grain exports, which supplied 40% of the wheat supply and helped avoid a world food crisis. Through naval weapon systems, information sharing and logistical resupply efforts within maritime borders, the U.S. Navy has provided combat advantages to Ukraine, which has since defined modern sea denial. So besides these advantages, how did the Ukraine partnership get better? Throughout last year, the Russian army used concentrated force to attack Kiev's sovereign territory and threaten Ukraine's Westphalian lines. Faced with aggressive and sustained Russian combat operations, Ukraine sought interaction and operational alignment with the West. Given Ukraine's history with and proximity to Russia, the U.S.-Ukraine operational relationship was largely based on trust. Ukrainian coastal defense forces communicated frequently with U.S. naval forces early in the conflict providing operational coordination in Odessa against Russia's control over Ukraine's naval approaches. Over time, direct information sharing procedures enabled tactical success and the ensuing combat advantages. The core component of trust has made interoperability between the U.S. and Ukraine a reality that produces tangible operational results. Evidence can be seen in the changes in the operations of the Black Sea Fleet of the Russian Navy around the Crimea. In addition, Ukraine 
indirectly allowed U.S. forces access to the Black Sea and gave direct naval warfare advantages over Ukraine's naval approach. After more than a year of war in Ukraine, Russia's Black Sea Fleet has been put on the defensive as U.S.-Ukrainian interoperability increased in volume and scope. NATO provided Ukraine with specific support that strengthened Western nations and mobilized the alliance, in particular from the beginning of the conflict until October 2022. More than 40 countries provided Ukraine with more than $97 billion in financial, humanitarian, and military aid. While Russia's military aggression was designed to threaten Western dominance and weaken the foundations of the NATO alliance, it had the opposite effect. The interests of the West were quickly aligned and brought closer together over time. The U.S. Navy's success in giving its Ukrainian partners a war advantage teaches important lessons by activating the fire of partnership, improving interoperability, and strengthening alliances. It is possible to create distinct advantages against the much larger and more capable Russian naval forces. A support for the Ukrainian war effort was purely developmental. However, it has shown that with the right partners, communications infrastructure and assets allocated before the crisis, U.S. support can be a decisive factor in conflicting great power competition. So what you guys think about this issue? Please express your thoughts in the comments. The biggest news comes from the South. Here, the intensity of Ukrainian attacks has reached new peaks as Ukrainians open several more lines of attack. Due to the increased pressure, Russians started losing their positions and the occupation authorities suddenly launched evacuation from the prefrontal settlements. The evacuation sparked panic about the beginning of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And today, Ukrainian Deputy Minister of Defense finally confirmed that the counteroffensive has started. Last time I told you that in the aftermath of reconnaissance in force operations, Ukrainians significantly reduced the Grey Zone area, got very close to Nesterenko, and started destroying Russian defense infrastructure in the village. I also told you that Ukrainians started slowly increasing the area of operation and activating along the whole front line. The freshest report suggests that Ukrainians breached the Russian defense in the trenches in front of Novodanilovka and got closer to Nesterenko and Kopelny from the east. This trench network posed a lot of inconveniences for Ukrainians, which is why it was one of their first targets. As you remember, the previous Ukrainian assault here failed because a part of the assault unit did not manage to cut the distance on time. It looks like the ongoing combat shakes down in the Zaporizhia region improve the level of coordination and combat capability and finally allow the Ukrainians to move further. Ukrainian presence was also noted in the southern part of Kamiansk, which means that Russians highly likely abandoned Piatikatki as well as the front moved south. Ukrainians started preparing for an attack on the next Russian trenches on the line. Getting closer also allowed Ukrainians to expose Russian motor crews that previously operated in the back and promptly destroyed them. In some places, Ukrainian drone operators managed to identify and destroy Russian tanks that were used to reinforce defensive positions. Ukrainian head of Melitopol reported that Russians announced an urgent evacuation from all settlements between Vasilivka and Tokmak in fear that this may very soon become the most active battleground. Russian intelligence reported that Ukrainians were spotted preparing to move in a lot of artillery systems. They also concluded that all artillery must be Western because only longer range artillery is fit for the prepared positions in order to prevent the accumulation of a critical amount of heavy equipment in the region. Russian forces started to actively use guided air bombs. These bombs weigh from 500 to 1,500 kilograms and have a range of up to 40 kilometers, which poses a significant threat to Ukrainian plans. The craters from the explosions are enormous and can reach up to 50 meters in diameter. Ukrainians are responding to these problems by creating fake warehouses and also reinforcing the region with air defense. However, in the meantime, Ukrainians are trained to reciprocate the damage and are also identifying and destroying Russian warehouses with ammunition and equipment. It looks like the same action is going to take place very soon in the arrive direction because Russian reconnaissance recently reported that Ukrainians are actively demining significant clusters of land. Another indicator of the imminent Ukrainian offensive actions here is the fact that certain elements of the 71st Jaeger Brigade and 46th Assault Brigade recently arrived at Orykiv. According to Russian sources, 
But while the soldiers around Orykiv are just preparing to launch an assault, the famous Ukrainian 72nd Mechanized Brigade conducted a series of assaults in the vicinity of Aladula. Previously, I told you that Ukrainians counterattacked Russians from the north undermined Russian defense in the eastern hamlet and then cleared it. Recent reports suggest that now they mostly focused on the south and attacked Russian positions in the Romanian three lines in front of the town. And most importantly, they attacked the northern part of Pavlivka. Ukrainians did not conduct any offensive actions in the direction of Pavlivka for a very long time. And even though it is possible that this was just a supporting attack to protect the flank, it can still be a part of the preparation for crossing the river in the future and further movement in the direction of Volnovka and Mariupol. The intensification of fighting along the whole southern line has been noted by many analysts. But today the Ukrainian Deputy Minister of Defense finally confirmed that the counter-offensive operation has started. She stated that it is incorrect to wait for a specific date because counter-offensive is a long process and it is only the culmination that happens quickly. But no one can predict when the culmination will happen, as it depends on the conditions on the ground. Right now, Ukrainians are testing Russian defenses, letting the newly formed assault units gain combat experience and for the most part, follow the path of lowest resistance, meaning they push where they can, leaving the strongest positions for later. Russian analysts are predicting that Ukrainians will make at least two huge attacks during the last week of April to test new tactics and then launch a full-scale counteroffensive.